Okay, so let me draw an analogy there, and you tell me what you think about this. Um, it's frequently the case that neophyte entrepreneurs who've created a product believe that the fundamental issue at hand is the product, right? It, when, when I started selling things into the marketplace, I suffered from the delusion that it was 85% product and you know, 10% administration and 5% marketing and sales. And that was like exactly backwards. And so it sounds to me like a similar issue here that you presumed that, except in the political realm, you presumed that if you had your policy prepared, you were already a credible person, that that would be the bulk of the initial battle. But what turned, if I've got you right, what turned out to be the case was a very sudden realization that while you had to get in the conversation at all, and that sounds like a sales and marketing problem to some degree. And this is, I think, why so many candidates who are credible turn to political consultants so rapidly, right? And, and that often sinks them. So, okay, so is that a reasonable analogy? And you, but you've, you've put products in the marketplace before. And so yeah. in principle, you knew that on the commercial side. So, well, I would say something about this is I, I agree with you on your analysis on the commercial side. What I would say is that is on steroids in the political side, right? So even if you transpose the commercial instinct onto politics, you'd be missing it by, by, uh, by a mile. The other thing is I came from industries that were a little bit different. I haven't really been in a consumer products industry or in the media industry. I mean, the industry that I spent the most time in was developing drugs for diseases that pharma had ignored systematically. And that was an area where, look, it's it's a regulated process. I saw from a front row seat how broken institutions like the FDA really are. But it's not an area where if you're pre-commercial and everything that I did was in the research and development phase, not in the commercial phase, it actually, it, I, I, as entrepreneurs go, I actually did not necessarily have that same experience as many consumer interfacing entrepreneurs. So that may be idiosyncratic to me. And then I would say even for consumer interfacing entrepreneurs, and Strive was a little bit closer to that because that's that's a that's a you know fund management company that competes at BlackRock. I had some of that experience. It was nothing close to what the importance is of that is in politics. Is it was all about to call it sales and marketing in some ways undersells the problem because sales and marketing is once you're once you're there, how much do you amplify how many people hear your message? Whereas for me at the early stages of the campaign, and as I think about the last year and even some of the things that later came back to become headwinds for me when I was a you know, front-running or, or whatever, top four, top five candidate, were actually the path to getting there sort of set me up for the difficulties that I had later on. But the first challenge was not even selling or marketing your message more effectively. It was literally like nobody would know that I was running for U.S. president, even though I was running for U.S. president. So it was just getting on the map or being heard in the first place. I just talked to Dean Phillips, and his campaign obviously came to an end. For those of you watching and listening, Dean Phillips was until recently running against Biden on the Democrat side, and he faced this problem in spades. I think he probably faced all the problems you faced, plus the additional problem was that he was absolutely 100% shut out of the entire Democrat apparatus. People were literally told that if they worked for him, they would never do anything politically again in their life. And then also he had to face the same reaction from the legacy media. And so he didn't get it. And I don't think that he was attuned well enough to the alternative media, let's say, you know, the podcast crowd and all that to capitalize on that quickly. Plus they tend to tilt more in the classic liberal conservative direction anyways. Okay, so you had to face this problem of getting on the map at all. So how did that yes. unfold? So so one of the things I did, and this is where you know I took good advice. You were one of the early people who offered a reflection on this. And you know I said, what, what's the downside in trying it? Makes a lot of sense to me is if the traditional media is ignoring you, go to the non-traditional media as a way to reach the people. And so I adopted a strategy, let's call it a maxim early in the campaign, which was the talk to everyone and anyone strategy. Okay, left, right, center, Cable news, non-cable news, print media, small-time media, local media, 
individuals walking on the street, recording it and putting it on social media. I wore, uh, you know, I'm wearing a little camera or I'm wearing a little, uh, what do you call it? A little microphone right now. I wore a microphone pretty much everywhere I went. We just clipped the conversations and put it out. Now, my social media following was a lot smaller than, than it ended up being at the end of the campaign. But still, that was just a way of putting out my message into the world. And what we started to notice was, you know, most of those things would get relatively small reach. But in a few instances, there were a lot of interactions where people actually began to take interest to say, wait a minute, that's an interaction of a kind that I haven't seen before. That's interesting to me. Some of them were not necessarily casting me in the most flattering light. I might not have looked good, right? Just even visually. You know, I, the things that I would have said were sometimes a little bit unscripted, may not have been said as eloquently as I might have prepared for in a speech or a TV interview. But that was actually part of what made it appealing. And so that started to take off, I think, allowed the campaign. There were a couple moments. And then I got called. I happened to be in New York City. And they said, do you want to come on uh, Don Lemon's show, right? Because many Republican candidates aren't going to go on there. So they thought they have a Republican candidate who's running. Why don't you go ahead and go on Don Lemon's show? We had a kind of interaction where this man lost, went haywire. I had just given a speech at the NRA meeting and he picked on one particular thing that I said, which is a fact of history, that black Americans in the United States did not get to enjoy their civil rights until they actually had their second amendment rights. And the first anti-gun laws that were passed in the United States were designed to keep gun guns out of the hands of black Americans. And that was part of a broader historical trend where even countries like China or Iran or other countries around the world that claim to offer the same Bill of Rights that the U.S. offers don't have a Second Amendment. And so Don Lemon, and, and the funny thing happened, actually, I thought I would, this would be a little bit of an aside, but I'll, I'll offer it. They said there was a list of topics. See, these are the, some of the tricks that the mainstream media plays. It was really interesting. There was a whole litany of topics. They said, this is what they would like to talk to you about. I forget what it was. It was something related to China policy, which you know I, I believe that the U.S. needs to declare independence from China. They gave a couple of others, but I specifically remember that being one of them. And then you go on the set, and what do you know is they've pulled a airlifted quotes from my speech at the NRA meeting with their own commentary as the wraparound as the lead into the interview when they have purposefully given me, it's not like they didn't think about it or they said, we're not going to tell you what we're going to talk about. So this is exactly what we're going to talk about, a litany for a you know relatively new presidential candidate, first time on their show. Here's a litany of what we're going to talk about. And it was not that it was that they decided to change topics in a, in a spontaneous way. It was designed as a trap. And so in that case, anyway, I gave Don Lemon on air a history lesson, which caused him to, it ended up being a big favor for me on the campaign, lose his mind. You know, the earpiece that he had in, he was screaming at the people who were the producers in his ears, saying it was distracting him as he was engaged in this debate with me. It was such an uncomfortable moment for everybody involved, including anybody watching it, that it ended up being, the New York Times reported the next couple of days later, the catalyst for Don Lemon actually getting fired by CNN. And so I had a few interactions like that, that that started to kind of increase the steam behind people at least paying attention to my candidacy. And, and things went on from there. So let me ask you about, well, let me ask you about that. So I want to know what other moments went viral, right? So that's a, that's a really interesting one because one of the, th well, there's two things about that that I find particularly interesting. The first is the way that these mainstream legacy media journalists set up the people that they're interviewing. So the game seems to be, and this has happened to me many, many times, the game is very straightforward. The game is, we will poke and prod at you with ill-informed but provocative opinions, hoping that by being as annoying as possible, you will say something fatally stupid demolish your reputation online and elevate my reputation, the journalist, as an investigator who can then walk away with like your scalp, so to speak, on his belt. Now, that's it, that's it. And so that's the kind of interview you face where every single word the interviewer utters is a verbal trap, okay? But my, my experience has been that if you hold, keep your head during that, interchange and you don't play the game, so you don't say anything stupid, you don't apologize, you don't get upset, that that can turn viciously, viciously in your favor. 
And yes. you said, okay, and so that's interesting. So I'd like to see your thoughts on that. And then I'd also like to know what other things you did in the alternative media and direct to consumer, direct to voter model that also went viral. You know, some of that's chance, right? If you put out 50 clips, you're going to get a Pareto distribution of effect. But did you start to see a pattern for the clips yes. that you got? Okay, so let's let's unwrap that. Let's yes. start and, with and the gotcha journalism, first of all. Well, well, the gotcha journalism, so my strategy ended up being, and it wasn't really a strategy. I think it's sort of how I'm wired first was to do exactly what you said, just rationally process exactly what they're telling you and respond rationally as the person on the other side increasingly loses their mind because you're not doing what they expected or planned or set you up to do which in turn, I think, makes them look, I think, far more illogical as a consequence when they were actually taking the Rufian populist Republican to try to make fry of them. Even for their own audience, they end up looking like the less reasonable ones. I went to the Breakfast Club, had a major viral exchange there where a woman, she was pressing me hard on the fact that I had only ever really had major accomplishments in the business world, that had never been in public service with utter unawareness that the last, and I believe successful president of the United States, Donald Trump came with a very similar background. And yeah, I think she was frustrated that I wasn't falling into her traps. And then she ended up giving a soliloquy about her experience in sixth grade, where she put together a coalition for lunch money or something like this, which to her own audience, which is a largely left of center audience, broadly panned, saying that we don't want to really hear about your sixth grade experience. We understand that somebody who is accomplished things in the business world, can at least have a legitimate case for having his ideas heard. This is coming from the left. Don Lemon's firing. I had an exchange with Chuck Todd where he said, "Are you? how can you have the level of certainty that there are two genders? And I explained <laughs> in the manner of somebody who <laughs> happens to have a biology degree, which I, I don't usually like using. You don't need a biology degree to know something about biology. You don't need to have a Harvard degree to be able to <clears throat> have standing to speak on a subject of science. But I have those things. And for an audience that particularly wrongfully elevates their attachment of value to those degrees, I decided to use that in my favor and broke down for him. Here's what two X chromosomes mean. Here's what an X and a Y chromosome mean. And that exchange went viral as well. And I think this one was more by chance, but he quickly was, was no longer on the air at Meet the Press, which is his main show shortly after I had done the same thing with Don Lemon, shortly after we had exchanges like that at the Breakfast Club. And then you think about the exchanges that I had on social media that ended up being the ones that really caught the public imagination were, again, interactions that I had in the field, let's call it, at the Iowa State Fair and other places where we had protesters or people who were purposefully trying to either disrupt my events or others, I got to give them credit, who were respectful but sharply disagreed with what I had to say and approached me in one-off conversations that weren't performative, but they were real conversations, authentic conversations between people who deeply disagreed on subject matter. And so if I'm to put those together, both between the corporate media realm as well as in the, in the let's just say, real world translated social media digital realm, that's the through line that I would draw is the thing that really ended up creating not just one off, but this ended up being a series of probably three, four months in there of repeated virality of interactions that were nothing more than the kind of interactions that I've been having for all of my adult life, which I enjoy, which I thrive on. You know, think about the people I went to school with at places like Harvard or Yale predominantly had political views that were different from mine. I leaned libertarian. Most of them lean liberal. Some of them are even friends of mine and remain friends of mine to this day. Authentic, heated, but earnest exchanges. In some cases, the person on the other side wasn't necessarily authentic in their motives. Take the Don Lemon. But you treat them as though they are, and then they self-immolate in front of you. That ended up really lifting up the campaign in this case now, far earlier than we expected, okay? Because when we saw me not lifting up off the ground, I think I calibrated myself to saying, okay, this is gonna be a long haul. It's gonna be only after the debates begin and let me at least try to qualify for those debates. Let me at least make that table stakes that I would qualify for the debates. And then after that, it would be a steady build up. Instead, something started happening where when I took the talk to everyone strategy, left-wing media, right-wing media, corporate media, podcasts and interactions, we actually saw a pickup that was then far earlier than I expected after I had recalibrated my own expectations. And that created new problems of its own, actually. 